All right, my name's Phil. I like to talk about politics, and in part two of the 60,000 subscriber special, I said I would go over some of the questions from the AMA that are on a more personal level. So you're not going to find any sort of political wisdom in here. This is more to do with the way I deal with the channel and, and my general life whilst doing the channel. So we'll go straight into the first one. Uh, this one, well, there's quite a bit to say about this one. It says, how much time a day do you spend between reading, filming, working and living my life? Now, it's sort of, uh, oh, so let's go through this. So the, the pattern's going to change a little bit over the next couple of weeks and then settle down to a d different sort of pattern. So as many people may know, so I do this full time, but I also keep my hand in teaching. And now the college, uh, I have, uh, I was doing a bit of cover work before summer. I'm now going to be on what's called a point two contract, which means point two of a full time contract. It, it'll be one class. So I'll be going in Monday afternoons and Wednesday mornings. And uh, that unfortunately will mean that when I get back on Wednesday, PMQs will have already happened. Obviously, I will watch it. It'll be on iPlayer. Um, but whereas before the summer when Parliament was sitting, I was able to get my video on PMQs out for the normal three o'clock slot. That won't be possible this time because I'll be too far behind, um, which gave me one of two possibilities realistically. Either on a Wednesday, the video comes out later, or I just do it first thing Thursday. I think first thing Thursday is the best thing to do. Because when I went full time, I started to adopt some of the things of perceived YouTube wisdom, one of which was having a set schedule for when videos come out. And, and I wasn't sure whether it was really that important, but I've now seen that actually it is. Um, so I'd rather not mess with the schedule. I'd rather just bring that out the following day. But anyway, so that's what it'll be. But for the over the next couple of weeks, I'm also doing some more cover. There's someone needs some cover. So I'm going to be covering some of their classes. Now, hopefully that shouldn't impact on the schedule as such, because with the cover I'm doing, I should still be able to do my normal 19 videos a week. However, it may mean that I'm doing some of them in the evening and, and that's where the lighting comes in. Now, I'll, I'll just sort of show you. Um, so I, so where I was, you know, when I was living in Scunthorpe, I'd set myself up a studio. It wasn't necessarily perfect, but it was, it was all right. It was getting there. Uh, then, and the lockdown happened. So I moved in with my girlfriend. And so I was in, in her dining room then again, setting up a studio, which, you know, sometimes something went a bit wrong with the lighting, but it was generally okay. Um, but that wasn't a very long-term solution now that I'm moving in with her properly, uh, forever. Um, so I've moved into the conservatory. So I'll, I'll show you how that works. So we'll have a little look around at the space I've moved into now. So, I mean, it's my girlfriend's conservatory. Or it was, it's now my man cave. <laughs> um, few things, the main things always lighting and sound. Of course, we're dealing with something like that. I mean, the camera, I just use a, a webcam there. Uh, I don't use this camera for recording things. Now, in terms of the blinds, you can see there's like three sorts of types. Uh, there's the Venetian blinds there, which were in here. We're sort of getting rid of those in favour of these sort of more blackouty blinds, which are very useful. Unfortunately, when we sort of got them, uh, because of the shape of the conservatory, we couldn't get them all round as single. So we need. that's why that window has none at all, because we removed them, but couldn't put the new ones up. So we're waiting for some doubles to arrive, which should fit in there, and then we'll get around to doing those as well. At which point I'll be able to stop the sun getting in, because sometimes, you know, you can't record at certain times of day just because uh, of the sun being away. So I could close the blinds. Now, at the moment, the way I'm mostly recording, mostly recording, when everyone thinks the lighting is working, it's because I'm just using natural light, as I'm going to be in a minute when I do the rest of this video. Um, there are going to be some times when I may not be able to do that and I'm going to need the lights. Now I have tried the lights before and some people noticed some videos recently there's a little bit not quite right and that's because the lighting is not quite right. That ring light's not going to do any good, it's just too close, uh, that only works much further away. So that's just going to have to go. I'm thinking of just moving these LED lights behind and just illuminating with that. Uh, I don't quite know how that's going to work out. But most of the time I am going to attempt to do using natural light. Now in terms of sound, obviously a couple of disadvantages. When it's raining, you do not fear it. Uh, there were a couple of videos recently where it was raining. There was nothing, it was just raining all day. Uh, I waited for it, I, it just never stopped. Uh, most of the time, like yesterday I was doing a video, it rained in the middle of it, no, I just stopped it. Uh, a few days ago, I was doing a video and uh, the bin lorry came. 
All right, it was the day for it. That was an occupational hazard, stopped recording. Then started again when it went. And then a low flying plane for the first time I've ever known here decided to go overhead. So I stopped again. And then a helicopter decided, well, you know, there you go. Um, so therefore one of those positions has to be a lie. And in the absence of any government credibility, people will decide on whichever one suits them. So I want to emphasize that. So you had a government minister saying there wouldn't even be a review. Planes never fly over there. Policy rather than face that sort of pressure. You have got to be kidding. A helicopter now. Oh sure, why not? Why don't we have a rocket ship next? When are the Thunderbirds coming over? Pissing hell. But you get what you can. But Abbott doesn't have that experience. He signed important trade deals, but they were negotiated by his predecessor. Um, now oh, bollocks. So, not really any more helpful than a climate change denier, but we must be fair. Oh, for f sake. What now? But that's where we are at the moment. It's all sort of, um, it's coming together that, um, and obviously with me largely, well, being full time, it means I don't, I can pick and choose when I record. If I sit down to record and either the lighting isn't quite right or the sound isn't quite right, do you know what? I can just put it off until later. So what, the only thing you wouldn't have seen there is of course the green screen, which is behind me at the moment, because I just, it's quite quick and easy for me to set that up. I, I did have a sort of a more rigid one, uh, which is still exists, it's folded up somewhere, but I've, I've now just got a smaller one, just have a couple of stands at the side. I just put them out, set it up. It takes less than a minute to set it up and less than a minute, obviously, to take it down again. Um, and it works really well. And as I say, with the natural light, that works pretty well. Um, when I settle back down and I'm no longer doing the extra cover work and I'm just doing my Monday afternoons and Wednesday mornings, again, there'll never any be, there'll never be need, unless there's a massively breaking story, for me to need the lights, but I'm still going to try and get the lights set up so that if I ever did have to film when it's dark at night, particularly as winter's drawing in, then I'll have that facility as well, because at the moment it's not ideal. Uh, in terms of the time I spend, I mean... It's very difficult to say exactly. It is definitely more than full time. You know, it's more than 40 hours. But because of the pattern of life, it's a very agreeable pattern of life. So what I usually do, I mean, first of all, I will do work every day of the week or seven days. But because it's uh, a hobby, it's the sort of thing I, I would like to do anyway, um, then it doesn't feel like work. Um, but generally speaking, on a weekday, I'll get up. I'll be down here for usually a bit before eight o'clock. Um, I, I update my spreadsheets because I, I keep, I like analysing data anyway, but it's a sensible thing to do. So I, I keep up to date with the data, see how the channel's doing, see how in videos are doing. Uh, do a little bit of that admin. Then check the news, see if there's anything breaking, see what the news headlines are looking like. Um, start to, to look at which sort of videos I'm going to be doing that particular day for the next, for release the next day. Sometimes, quite often I've moved into a pattern of the first two videos of the day will already be out the previous night, but the three o'clock one I may do on the day itself, just in case there's anything uh, breaking. And even if not, if I've already done it, I could still just reschedule it for the next day and, and do something. I want to get it out a little bit more quickly. Um, so yeah, in terms of time, what I would generally say is throughout the day, I will just spend a little bit of time researching, reading, a little bit of time writing a few things down, a little bit of time going to see my girlfriend who may also be working because she's working at home at the moment um, and snuggle down with the puggles a bit or do a bit of hobbying. Uh, and then and I just keep cycling around and around and around and that can go all the way through the day. You know, so effectively I could be starting work at before eight o'clock and I may not finish until like eight o'clock at night. And, and it doesn't feel like a really long day because I haven't spent all of that time working. Um, and, and because it's it's a very, you know, it's nice. I mean, sometimes I can just, as I say, go to where my girlfriend sets up in her office, take a tablet, and I can just be browsing some stories while I'm there. I've, I've also got a laptop I could be setting up. I could be writing things out as well. The only time I ever really need to be in here is of course when I'm filming but it is still better to be in here because I've got a better setup to monitor stuff like that, which is very nice for writing, looking things up, uh, watching videos if I have to as well.
So it's really difficult in terms of how much time a day I spend. What I would say is it probably works out around about a full-time thing. Saturdays is my lightest day. Friday, in fact, Fridays and Saturdays tend to be fairly light, relatively speaking. Sunday, ironically, is my busiest day. <laughs> Sunday is the busiest day. Um, particularly as on most Sundays, I also do a live stream for patrons. But, um, but even you know, without that, I do as much on a Sunday as I would any other day, plus the live stream. Plus, usually, I sort of call that the start of my week. So I also... Um, so I have a Word document, for example, each week where whenever I read something that might be interesting, I make some notes on it, quick notes, put some links in there. And that's my thing for the the scripts and, and notes and things like that for the week. On a Sunday, I just start a new one. Anything that's left over from the previous week that I think might still be of interest, because there's all sorts of topics that I sometimes think of doing. Sometimes I even write whole scripts and then decide, oh, no, I'm not going to do this. I did that yesterday, in fact, and I'm probably not going to use it in the end. Um, but it's, uh, so yeah, I transfer that to the new week's one. So Sunday is what I call the start of my week. But there we go. It is, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's, uh, you do sometimes, the, if I'm going to have some downsides to it, downsides are sometimes you go to bed thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know what my videos are going to be on. It's like the news has stopped. I hope there's some breaking news tomorrow. There's usually something. Obviously, there's always things that are going to be interesting to talk about. But what you're also thinking when you're doing it full time and your income de depends upon it is you're also starting to think in terms of, OK, so what are the, um, you know, wh what's going to do well? Because I'm not always brilliant at that. Sometimes I think, oh, yes, yeah, video is going to do great. And it's rubbish. Sometimes I think, well, I really want to talk about this. And then it does really well. And I'm really surprised. Um, it's just what it is. But uh, but yeah, so hopefully that answers that as, to a reasonable degree. Uh, next one says, will I consider getting my hands on an EU passport and uh, leaving? No. Um, no, I wouldn't. I mean, first of all, I wouldn't be able to get an EU passport. I, I, I don't have any um, uh, any way of doing that. I don't have Irish. Well, I may have Irish ancestors going way back. Certainly got Scottish ones, but not necessarily close enough in the past to be worth it. And... Uh, I, I wouldn't want to leave the country. I mean, I know the, the impression some people are getting of the country at the moment, but, you know, it's not, it's not, it is and it isn't true. I mean, you know, the, there are an awful lot of people that are presenting this view and they have those views, but they were always there and they're there in every country. It's just that in most sane countries, you shut them up and we shut them up in this country for quite a long time. They were, they were like hidden away, um, Whereas now they've been allowed to come out and they've been supported by both government and the media, which is disappointing. But it's not what I get. You know, this this sort of view, um, this sort of jingoistic racism that you that is being projected to the world from Britain at the moment, in particular from England. is not what I when I talk to people, you don't get that. They they don't have those views. They don't believe in those views things um, it's just been amplified it's a minority amplifying them so I've no re I would I wouldn't want to leave anyway there was a time some years ago actually um, where someone was advising me they should you should go and teach in the Middle East you get paid a fortune tax-free brilliant life and it, it, the fact that it was a dry country wouldn't even be a hassle for me and I know some people still go there and find little ways to do it. I wouldn't do that I wouldn't break the laws in the country it wouldn't be a problem for me because I'm not uh, an alcoholic anyway, unlike many teachers. Um, so, you know, but I just thought, you'd, I, I, a lot of people leave a country and go and emigrate somewhere. You, you hear it a lot of the time, British people going to emigrate in Australia, and then you get quite a lot come back because they don't like it. And I think what they don't realise, and I'm perfectly aware of this, you miss little things. You miss your fish and chips. You know, you're just, the, just the things about being in that country you just miss. And I, I sort of, Whereas a lot of people take things like that for granted. They, you know, it's the grass is always greener. They see the benefits of, of certain other countries. And then you leave and then you miss it. And, and I would miss it. And I know that. And besides, I'm settling down now anyway. So, you know, that's it. I'm stuck here. Uh, not that I think of it as stuck here. But anyway. Next one. It says, have I ever considered doing co uh, collaborations with other YouTubers to have kind of discussion live streams? Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to doing that at all. I haven't seriously thought about it because um, I would never be an instigator for something like this. You see, I'm a massive introvert. 
And uh, I hope people sometimes, when I say that, you're not shy. As if shy, shy has got nothing to do with introversion, in being introverted. Although I used to be painfully shy. Incredibly shy. So, Well, with people I didn't know. I was always fairly confident once I got to know people. But with people I didn't know, I was painfully shy. And when I went to university, because I went to university specifically to become a teacher, and, and being someone who's not completely, you know, thick, I thought to myself, well, do you know what? As a teacher, I'm going to have to be a lot very confident in front of strangers because all my classes are going to be strangers when I first meet them. So what I did when I went to university, because the fear when you're shy, the fear is always saying or doing something uh, wrong and giving a bad impression. So I thought, well, I'm, do you know what? I'm going to university. I've got my flatmates. Let's not piss them off. I'm stuck with them for a year. But when I go to parties and things like that, do you know what? If I make a fool of myself, I never have to see that person again. I'll just go to a different party the next weekend. So I just did, I, I just came out. I just forced myself to be more assertive. Um, took it by myself. And, 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 you know, in the end, you just managed to cope. It's a little bit like having a stammer. You know, you don't lose it, but you cope. You manage so that maybe people don't realise. Um, but I am very, very introverted. The idea of me approaching someone and saying, do you want to do something? Particularly as I can't even think of like the format it would take either. It's not even like I've got a great idea. And, oh, yeah, I'll do this and we could do it in this format. No idea. If someone approached me and said, that's a couple of people have done in the past. But then when I have sort of got back to them and said, yeah, sure, they've not come back. But, you know, if someone were to do that and I were to see it. And I it, sometimes it is difficult because sometimes... No matter which avenue people try and contact me from, I get so many messages, sometimes I don't see them all. But if someone did, I wouldn't be opposed to it. It depends on, you know, but I generally wouldn't be opposed to it. But I would never be the sort of person that would go to someone and go, do you want to do this? Because that's not me. Um, this is why I'd be terrible in marketing or PR. The idea of going to a stranger and saying, do you want to do this thing? No, 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 no. Um, next one it says, have I had any recent actual physical conversations with Brexiters that I know personally? Um, what's their outlook and what's coming after the 1st of January? Any sign that they think they made a mistake or still in denial? A bit difficult here in Ireland to gauge their mood as they seem to have gone very quiet. Um, yes and no. It depends how what you call recent. If you mean this year since we left the EU, yes. But obviously COVID has sort of knocked the tin on that. I've not known personally a great many Brexit supporters because apart from anything else, if they tried to be a Brexit supporter, they would have had me arguing with them for the last four years. Um, the odd one, the odd one. But that was all before lockdown. So in terms of recent, as in the last six months, even no, because lockdown. And, you know... The, I mean, what I would say is, obviously, if anyone's going to get into an argument with me on anything to do with Brexit, you go through the usual debating procedure, which is someone presents a viewpoint. OK, you have that viewpoint. So that viewpoint will be based upon certain facts. So you explore those facts. You ask them. So what what facts are you grounding this viewpoint on? And then you explain, you explore how they know they are facts. So where have you got these facts from? And it's very, very easy if someone has got something genuinely wrong. See, the, the great skill of debating is to win when you are wrong, when your opponent is actually correct and you convince them that they're wrong. But it's not a debating competition we're talking about here. It's just a genuine debate. Um, and once you sort of show them that the fact that they think is a fact is not a fact at all, because you can prove it. You know, if it's supposedly based on some rule in the EU, well, that's easy. You can get up online all the EU treaties. You can go, well, where is it then? It's not there. Um, once you've got a reasonably intelligent person to realise that some fact that they were basing their viewpoint on isn't a fact at all, it's wrong, they will inevitably question it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will change their view, but a reasonably intelligent person will go, well, actually, I think I might need to rethink this. So that's generally how it's gone when the small number of people who are willing to say that they're in favour of Brexit within a five metre radius of me, um, that tends to be how it goes. But it, in terms of very recent, no, because I don't have the opportunity to physically meet very many people. You know, um, I wouldn't do it at work. You know, if any student, I, I wouldn't discuss those sorts of things with students anyway. Uh, I'm a science and engineering teacher at the moment. Um, and my opportunities to meet other people are basically nil at the moment. 
So yeah, so before the referendum, uh, before, sorry, after we left the EU, but before the lockdown, I talked to literally two or three, I think it was. Um, and yeah, they, you know, all you do is you just say, okay, this fact that you, th you think you're basing it on, let's explore that. And you just show them that actually it's wrong. Uh, so I don't really know, in terms of the mood of some of these people, how it's changing. I, I don't know. I don't know because I'm not talking to them recently. Uh, next one says, Jaffa Cakes or Hobnobs? Ooh. Yeah, that is a tricky one. All I would say is this. Like, um, if I have a packet of Hobnobs, I can have a Hobnob now and then. If I have a packet of Jaffa Cakes, it's very soon a very empty packet of Jaffa Cakes. But that could be partly due to the fact the Jaffa Cakes can go down a lot more easily. So it doesn't necessarily mean I prefer Jaffa Cakes to Hobnobs, but they, uh, but they are gone much more quickly. So I don't know. But possibly the empirical evidence would suggest Jaffa Cakes are better. Uh, next one says, could I give any assessment how far my channel is watched by policymakers and estimate what impact it would have? Um, yeah, I strongly suspect not at all. <laughs> I, I am not aware of any policymakers that watch my channel. The closest thing I have, and I need to get back to these people, is I'm really bad at this sort of stuff, is I had um, a think tank get in touch with me uh, to see if I wanted to, to um, avail their experts, their academic experts, of any information, which I actually would do in certain areas. Um, my internet seems to have died. That's good. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so no, uh, I'm not aware of anyone that influences policy at all who watches me and therefore the impact it has on policy, I'm quite certain, is zero. Because apart from anything else, at the moment, uh, the policies that matter are made by Conservative government. I hardly think that I am persuading very far right wing think tanks to change their minds and adopt socialism. Um, but there we go. Uh, next one, it says, I'd like uh, to know what is stopping you from using this platform from reaching further by launching petitions regarding the sensitive and sensible topics you discuss here. Appreciate if you show, show your thoughts on this option. I have attempted it a few times and it's gone disastrously wrong every single time. I'm not a very good campaigner from that point of view, I don't think. Um, yeah, there are times when I absolutely will use it for, for things like that. Try and use it sparingly. Um, because there is such a thing as, I, I think, a sort of overexposure of certain things. Like one at the moment may well... See, I, I'm umming and ahhing over this so-called 3.5% movement. Because one, I'm not convinced by uh, the conclusions of it. It doesn't do any harm to talk about it potentially. But, you know, before I do, I'd want to sort of at least have a firm view myself. One, is its conclusions valid? To how realistic is it in the first place? For those who don't know, the 3.5%. It's the idea that if you have 3.5% of the population willing to rise up and really demand something, then they'll get it. You know, they can bring down a government if that is the thing they're demanding. Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. Um, but also, you know then you'd sort of have to think, so how do you do a video in a way that sort of inspires people to do it? Because what am I asking them to do at the moment during lockdown? What, go and march in the street? So there are, but there are things in the past where I've sort of tried to, you know, someone's asked me to sort of highlight something and I've done that. And it's always gone. The, the last time I tried to do it was ironically, again, promoting a protest that was then hit by the lockdown. So, oh, so that protest then didn't happen because lockdown was for me. Well, that went well. Um, so yeah, I have, uh, I'm a bit of a jinx for these sorts of things. So I try and be a little bit careful. But there is the potential and, you know, I would like to think that come the next, um, I, I mean, the other side of it is I don't want to tell people what to do either. I'd much rather present an argument and at best let people know the options. But um, I would like to think that by the time the next election, general election comes around, because there'll be local elections before then, but that by the time the next general election comes around, then maybe, just maybe, I will be able to get out a message to a much greater number of people than I would have been able to at the last general election. Although there, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad when you worked out how many people from the UK 
um, were watching my videos because you can get that information. You know, YouTube does allow you to know the number of unique viewers that are watching your content. So you can account for potentially for people watching it multiple times. Um, and then who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll be able to sort of... Because um, cause what I'm imagining will happen at the next general election is much like tried to happen in 2019, but maybe it'll work more effectively in 2024, is getting people to use their vote strategically. And maybe I will be able to help with that, um, is what I would imagine there. Um, what would I like to see from a truly modern education system? Is there anything that should be taught that isn't vice versa? And what might the structured school day look like? Okay, well, we'll start with the last bit first, the structured school day. So I think this is in the Netherlands, somewhere in Europe. Um, they take account of the fact that, do you know what? Teenagers, don't, not like adults, they really don't get on well in early morning. So I think there's a, a country in Northern Europe where they just, they start the school day at like 10 o'clock or something. So in terms of like the school, that's what I would do. Start it later, end it later. You know, what's the point with bleary eyed teenagers trying to get things through to them? They're not awake yet. Um, so, you know, some, the problem is that the school day, or it used to be based on the normal working day, but it doesn't work like that. Now it's even worse because now, they get there early, right? Half eight, ten to nine, something like that. Depends on the school. And then they finish. Oh, my internet's back. Excellent. Uh, and then they finish at um, like half two, three o'clock or something. It used to be the case in my day. So you're ramming them as well. Like there's no proper breaks between the lessons. You're going from one lesson, heavy going academic lesson to another, to another. Not much time for lunch even. It's like, well, no, this is bad. Obviously, we know the re the reason is lack of funding, but, you know, it's not good. So, yeah, structuring the school day would help enormously. Secondly, you know, in terms of things that talk, there needs to be much more emphasis on just non-academic. The way it seems to me is education is you get them to do as many subjects as possible um, just to stop your teachers actually teaching them something useful. And that's what it's about, because... Most kids, even intelligent kids, six months after leaving school, they've forgotten everything. They can remember, they, okay, they can still read and write and they can still do a few sums. Most things they've forgotten about. Like, I'm going to be kicking off next week with the first lesson for a group of A-level physics students. Bright students, um, some of those are going to go on to get like the top grade A, a star. But they will be stupid. I will see a group of stupid people next Thursday when I first see them. Um, idiots, complete imbeciles. They don't know anything. They've forgotten it all. I mean, these are even worse this year because they stopped their lessons a long time ago. Forgotten it all. Okay, the good ones, the bright ones will pick it up very quickly. Um, but that's what I mean. If they, don't, if they don't do it at A-level or do any further study, they've forgotten it all. So why are we teaching them all this crap? You know, it's it's important that you do lessons in things like science and maths and English and stuff like that, of course, um, particularly for those who do want to continue it later on. But it's too many. They don't need, they're not going to remember them all and they don't need them all. Let them select a bit better and then you've got more time for teaching them. They don't know how budgeting works. They don't know how parliament works. They do not know how their own political system works. You know, they don't know enough about their statutory rights as citizens. They don't know about, you know, consumer rights. That's going to be an issue. I may even do a video on that soon because my girlfriend's eldest has uh, has suffered at the hands of someone who was going to give them a refund and then has decided not to. So uh, I shall be getting the solicitor on that one. Uh, RE, the Consumer Rights Act 2015 next week. But anyway, but, but people don't know their rights. They don't know their employment rights. So I all the time get students chuntering about you know, what their bosses had, had done and stuff like this. I'm thinking, they, you have the right to say no. They don't realise. They don't know their employment rights. They don't know their rights at all. So you could have more time empowering the citizenry. Government don't really want that. What is it? It's often said, and it's been said for decades, that what government want is a population just smart enough to operate the machine of state, but not smart enough to question that government. That's what needs changing, really, fundamentally needs changing. Um, 
And, and for some kids as well, the academic life, it's fairly evident, even when they're about 14, is not going to be for them. Let them choose, you know, to do more vocational stuff, more practical skills as well. Because we don't need a country full of academics. We need mechanics, we need plumbers, we need plasterers, we need, you know, massively short of engineers, hugely short of engineers. And, and some of those engineers are going to need to follow the academic route, of course. Many of them are not. So that's what I would have. I would have uh, an education system that had two foci effectively. One, producing good, strong, knowledgeable citizens. And the second one, ones that are fit for the place of work, providing what we actually need to drive our economy. And, and just I'll finish on one final point on this one. You know, one of the biggest mistakes the government's ever made, it was a Conservative government, but I'm not going to deny it may have happened under a Labour government as well as it was in the 80s. Now in the 80s, when I was at school, we were taught programming. Then that disappeared. And what caused it to disappear, apparently, I didn't know at the time, I was too young, was the government basically said to me, look, what do you want? What skills do you want them to teach? And basically the answer from industry was, we want you to teach them how to operate software. Basi and that's all they did. I keep saying basically, sorry. Um, they, that's all they did. They just taught them how to use word processors and spreadsheets and blah, crap. And I had clever, when I became a teacher, clever students who would moan about IT lessons because they could teach themselves this stuff. All they were learning to use was Microsoft Office. That was it. Worthless to them. And what it meant was we stopped teaching programming. We used to have a truly, you know, world competing computer industry. We don't anymore. And that one policy, you know, the government decided making a conscious decision and, you know, to be fair to them, it was not against advice. It was with the advice, but it was the wrong advice. Um, you know, made a conscious decision to stop teaching programming and just teach people how to use machines and not build them. Fatal, absolutely fatal mistake. And we keep making the same mistakes. Anyway, there we go. Um, have I noticed a mood change on the streets around my area during the Brexit era? era? Again, um, uh no, like I say, I, I, at no point did I really know very many people that were pro-Brexit anyway. I had come across a few, I will say, where they were sort of in favour of Brexit and then changed their mind. Uh, some of those people, it was just because they realised they were being lied to. For some of them, it wasn't even that. Uh, it was just that they just realised that it was harmful to us to be leaving the EU. It's a little bit like, uh, I suppose, when I busted my knee when I was a teenager and I had to have crutches, but I didn't get to have the nice aluminium alloy crutches. I had the big wooden ones that cut off the blood supply to your arms. And I hated those crutches, absolutely hated them. Uh, but Brexit was almost like getting rid of the crutches. Or do you know what I would have hated even more than the crutches? Trying to hobble around without them. You know, you may not like the, 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 the crutches, but you really hate the alternative. Uh, I think that's what it was for some people as well. They sort of, they didn't like the crutches and they threw them away. And then they thought, do you know what? I don't like the crutches, but I'm better off with them <laughs> than without them. Um, so I saw a fair amount of that as well. But it, in terms of a sea change, again, even though I've lived in very pro-Brexit areas because the people I personally would talk to were not, of that mindset anyway you know didn't i didn't come across too many of them um ironically most of these sort of fervent brexiteers i came across tended to be the ones who were brexiteers because corbyn was a brexiteer you know they just do everything that king corbyn says um but there's no there's no legislating for that one is there so personally no obviously i can observe things um around the country sort of more remotely for which there is, I mean, we can see from polling, there has been a change of mind, of course. Next one says, uh, I wonder why British news media is so weird and the belief in journalism is so low compared to other EU countries, that is. Is it that the news does not get tried by an authority like many countries? Is it rooted in the first past the post system? Uh, I, I, right, uh, how are laws around news media implemented in the UK? They're basically not, this is the problem. Um, there are very few laws sort of making the media behave responsibly, which means you have an absolute opportunity for very wealthy, far-right 
people to buy up the media, which they did, and then use it as their personal propaganda machine. It got into a great deal of trouble a, long t a while ago. It was a long time ago now. Um, the phone hacking scandal. They were fucking, uh, fucking, hacking the phones. Maybe we should call it that, fucking. Phone hacking, yeah, I've come up with a new word, excellent. So they uh, they got into uh, hacking people's phones and it all came out, it was very, very serious. And uh, there was an inquiry, the Levinson inquiry, which made certain recommendations, not all of which were implemented. And Boris Johnson promised in his manifesto that not only would he not implement the rest of the recommendations, but he's going to abolish the ones that were implemented. So there's very little that the media has to do by law now. And what there is, is going to be disappearing uh, in fairly short order, you would imagine. And yes, I do think that is part of it. The fact that the media can get to be so reckless um, and, and there's no legal recourse, I think is a massive, massive part of it. A free press is, of course, vital. We cannot have a situation where the government, which is, I mean, this is what we do have in this country. It's really weird. Like, there's a sort of... Um, a, a, a circle aspect to it because you've got a large section of the media that forced the government to beat to their drum. The, the Prime Minister and, and any Prime Minister, not just Boris Johnson, will open the, the headlines, uh, have a look at the headlines, open the newspapers and march to the beat of their drum. You know, if the headlines are attacking them, he will want to do something to appease them. So you've got a, a you know, way so the Conservatives are going to appease certain sections of the media. Then they have control over the others, like the BBC. In theory, they don't have direct control over the BBC, but they control their funding stream. And so the BBC news team, I mean, most of it is is absolutely spot on. The BBC is a, a wonderful institution. But the political news team is letting down the whole side. And the government have encouraged this. Um, so what should be an independent news organisation isn't. So you've got that aspect of it as well. And there's too little of the media uh, really on the side of the people. There are some, there's a couple, um, but, you know, they don't have very wealthy media barons behind them. You know, they have to work on a, a sensible business footing. They can't afford to make a loss every now and then just to get a piece of propaganda out. Um, so yeah, it, it is a big problem. It, I think it is, I am, I'm sure it's very complex, but I'm sure a lot of it is also rooted in the fact that legally they can do as they like. They can publish all sorts of lies and nothing really happens. The worst that can happen is if they libel someone, they'll be taken to court and then, you know, they'll lose the case. But it, even when sometimes a paper is forced to retract a story, the story is read by a certain number of people. Not everyone who reads that story will then go on to read the retraction. And if they do, they won't necessarily believe the retraction. They go, oh, yo, know, the judge just forced them to do it. Yeah, they forced them to do it because what they said originally was wrong. But they won't always see it that way. Um, so there it is. Uh, last, oh, no, there's another one. Oh, here one. How did I meet my girlfriend? Oh, oh ah, that was an interesting one. Online, of course. Online. <laughs> um interestingly i had uh i think what actually did it and i feel very conflicted about this because many, many people will know i was not impressed with jeremy corby's leadership you know losing two general elections against two of the weakest prime ministers this country's ever had sort of do that for you and um but you know i was putting various pictures up there and i thought i'll put a picture up that shows what i do and i did this this is what i was doing and um it just so happened that I'd been doing a video with about Jeremy Corbyn. So I had Jeremy Corbyn in the background. And that was one of my like profile pictures. And, and she was uh, not only a Labour supporter, she still is, she was a Co Jeremy Corbyn supporter. And although she doesn't have the dim view of him that I do, she does now accept that he needed to go. And she's, you know, very happy about the way Keir Starmer is doing things. But she was a massive Jeremy Corbyn fan. So that caught her eye. Now, I'm very conflicted about this because um, well, I was not a Jeremy Corbyn fan. But it sort of, it, the image for me was useful because it basically showed what I did, because the YouTube thing, and also that I was a Labour supporter. Because at the end of the day, there are people, granted, there are people who get together and have very happy, long, happy relationships 
where one person might be a Labour supporter and one might be a Conservative supporter. But I strongly suspect they'll both be grouped fairly close to the centre. I am not, uh, I am not anywhere near the centre, really. Although I, uh, many people think I am because I don't attack people in the centre. If people are reasonable, I don't care where they are politically, I'll argue with them. But if they're reasonable people, they're reasonable people and they don't need me attacking them. But um, so, yeah, I thought, do you know what? Politics can be an issue. I might as well just make it clear where I am on this in, in politics. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what did that. So Jeremy Corbyn, I've got that to thank him for. But it, it would have worked just as well with any Labour leader, it has to be said. Uh, then the last one is about a documentary of someone here advocating uh, the spider's web about tax avoidance. Um, it says, the irony of watching the old school tie network tribalism being slagged off by one of the worst tax avoiding entertainment providers is not lost to me. What documentary would I recommend? Well, that's really easy just to finish off. The Great Hack, simple as that. Um, the story of the Cambridge Analytica and how Carol Cadwallader sort of broke the story. Um, absolutely essential viewing, I would say. Essential viewing because it's really important to note that Cambridge Analytica, although the company no longer exists, it wasn't shut down. It shut itself down to prevent and force, you know, investigators basically finding out exactly what they'd been up to. So the same people are still operating now. The same techniques are still operating now. Um, everything that Cambridge Analytica did is still being done now, just by other organisations, by, well, by the same people in other organisations. And the... Um, the damage that they did in 2016 is still continuing right now. If anything, their techniques have been refined and are more effective. The law has certainly not caught up because in the two countries where it's been hit the most, the United Kingdom and the United States of America, there has been no stomach on the part of either government to tackle these abuses. In fact, they've been benefiting from them, so they would like to continue to benefit from them as well. Uh, so easy. If you haven't already seen The Great Hack, I think it's on Netflix, then that's what you should watch. Uh, that would be my recommendation anyway. But there we are. Uh, there's another long one. Hope you found that video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And until later, I will uh, see you. Until next time, I will see you later. I can't even remember my own words.